Thank you so much, Hugh, for joining us from the British Hedgehog Preservation Society. Um, for people who are not familiar with the BHPS, could you tell us a little bit about it and what it is you guys do? Well, back in 1982, Major Adrian Coles, a uh, retired um, military man, found hedgehogs stuck in a cattle grid. So uh, to, to stop, you know, I'm not quite sure what you'd call them in, in, in Portugal or in the Netherlands, but the metal bars across a hole in the road to stop cattle moving from uh, out onto to off fields into public land. And um, steep drop, hedgehogs were dropping in and were getting stuck. And so he saw that and he thought, this is a bit sad. So he got a couple of bricks, put them in to allow the hedgehogs to climb out. And then it began, an idea was saying, so, wait a minute, we should have a campaign about this. So it went uh, very public. He managed to get lots of TV exposure, launched the Hedgehog Society off the back of this idea. And it was just that simple thing which started it. But the realization that that massively popular animal, every time there's a vote or a poll uh, in Britain, certainly the favorite animal, the favorite wildlife icon, whatever, is the hedgehog. Uh, so we love the hedgehog. Uh, let's find ways of trying to help them. And the British Hedgehog Preservation Society was born out of that um, and is something which we use a lot of we base conservation messaging on science. We tend to work with um, um, you know, some of the best ecologists in the country to try and get the best way of understanding what's going on out there so that we can then present the best solutions to try and solve the problems that hedgehogs face. So what was, why did you jo join the Hedgehog Society? Why, what was your personal motivation for that? Well, I mean, surely it's obvious because hedgehogs are the most important, most gorgeous, most amazing species. I mean, you may think otherwise, but simply um, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> and yeah, the hedgehogs are, are an astoundingly wonderful creature. I, I, I'm an ecologist by, by training. I was started studying hedgehogs back in uh, long before you were born. Back in 1986, I did my first hedgehog work when I was a student. Um, looking at hedgehogs on an island off the north of Scotland, um, off in Orkney, called North Ronaldsey. Hedgehogs have been introduced there uh, in the 1970s and were now perceived to be having a massively negative impact on the breeding success of ground nesting birds. So I was up there doing that as a degree study and then did a little bit more stuff on hedgehogs because found nobody else was really doing much. There's only two other people really working on hedgehog ecology. And then I did a bit more and then a bit more and uh, then I was radio tracking hedgehogs and I got um, I was radio tracking hedgehogs and got invited to write a feature article for my favorite magazine and at that point I'd never written anything other than sort of you know scientific reports and so I wrote a, a feature article with photographs and everything for this this ma amazing magazine called the BBC Wildlife magazine and then suddenly went, oh I enjoy this and so I started I drifted into becoming a sort of journalist and then I have um I uh, got involved being a campaigning journalist, got around to hedgehogs again when they were trying to kill them in the Outer Hebrides, again to protect birds. And that's when I started working more formally with the Hedgehog Society. So that would have been back in 2003, I started working with them more formally. Um, so yes, I, it, it's, it, they've always been lingering there in the background. And um, with the Hedgehog, Hedgehog Society, is there is it only for education and research or do they also have a clinic for rehabilitation? How does that work a little bit? Well, um, it, the, in the United Kingdom, we have no legislation, no licensing around um, hedgehog rescue wildlife hospitals. Uh, I know that in um, certainly in the Netherlands, um, I know in Denmark, they've just started doing it as well um that there are, there are you know, really sensible steps forward to have licensing arrangements so if you want to run a hedgehog hospital you've actually got to show that you're not a nitwit um and it's uh but here anybody can do it mm -hmm. um so it's very difficult for the society to be able to say um to, to run a clinic we, we, we have no capacity for it we've got sort of two and a half staff i mean it's a very small organization i'm i i get paid a day a month to do media things. I'm a spokesperson. Um, so we don't actually have a clinic. We don't run a thing like that. But there is a list of about 600 different hedgehog rescuers around the country of varying quality um, from the nitwit to the really quite excellent. Mm -hmm. And um, when people get in touch because they found an injured hedgehog or they're stuck with a hedgehog they're not to do, they get in touch with the Hedgehog Society and then we direct them to the nearest hedgehog rescue. And uh, but we don't recommend them 
in a sense, because we, we, we haven't got the capacity to go around and check whether they're any good. And there is no sort of regime in place to be able to um, sort of demand certain practices that take place. Eventually, we'll get there, but not at the moment. Yeah. So on your website, for example, I saw that there is a how to create a feeding station for hedgehogs. And it's very, um, it's in like an illustration. It's very visual. And it looks really, really cool and really nice. I was thinking, is there more stuff you do like that? And, and how important is that to, to the hedgehog society doing that kind of education? Um, so the British Hedgehog Preservation Society's website, which is website which is BritishHedgehogs.org, I think, or maybe .org.uk, should know that. The there's loads and loads of those sorts of things. How to to um, make your garden hedgehog friendly? How to remove hazards from your garden? The sorts of things you should and shouldn't feed hedgehogs. So no vast. I mean, the most of the work I do is to do with communication. Is to do with education. Um, I you know I will I will turn up at schools. I will do lectures to postgraduate research groups. I'm not proud who I talk to. Um, it's it's just an opportunity of being able to share with people my passion and enthusiasm not just for hedgehogs but for ecology in general and the wider uh, environment uh, um, in fact i use the hedgehog quite mercilessly because everybody loves hedgehogs it means i get to talk about some of the less um exciting uh issues out there you know transport infrastructure and agricultural policy and the planning regime and uh, I know the necessity of dismantling industrial capitalism all of these things yeah you know, I can talk about uh, because actually these are all things that impact on hedgehogs so when you say these are things that are impacting hedgehogs so it's not just um, people in their gardening it also has to do with uh, farming and uh, other other things or like what are the the disturbances that hedgehogs face currently well there's a, a wide range and, and very roughly we have split the uk population into rural hedgehogs um in farmland and urban hedgehogs it's they're the same hedgehog it's just where they are that's all and it's just a convenient way of looking at the threats that they face um in our rural landscape the main thing is loss of food i mean i i you are probably well aware of the catastrophic decline of macroinvertebrate fauna, so the flying insects, the flying bigger bugs and beasts. Many, many studies showing that um, insect life is being wiped out. And this is um, the result of intensive industrialized agriculture. Uh, now, obviously, the hedgehogs aren't leaping around like bats and birds catching insects in the air, but each of those insects, they lay eggs, which become the grubs, which become the insects in the end. So, so you know, the hedgehogs feed on that sort of stage in their lives. So when they're not there, when there is no food, the hedgehogs have got nothing to eat. Um, they also face uh, uh, an environment, the hedgehog, they, they're an edge specialist. So the bigger the fields, the wider the areas, it's harder for them to move through the landscape because they tend to go to the edge. Um, in the UK, uh, they have a, a complicated relationship with the badger. Um, badgers and hedgehogs compete for the same food resource. Badgers create a landscape of fear, which again further restricts the hedgehog's ability to move through the landscape. So in the farmed landscape, those are the main issues. Principally, it's down to loss of food and loss of habitat. And in the urban landscape, it's down to the fragmentation of what remains. So, well, suburban, I should say, right in the middle of cities with lots of concrete. Obviously, hedgehogs don't really find much to eat there. Yes, we, we, foxes may make their home in there, but hedgehogs aren't quite as agile as them. So the hedgehogs find themselves in suburbia where we've got gardens backing onto houses next to parks. And this is great, but there is a tendency to chop these things up into smaller and smaller blocks. Hmm. And we know that, that hedgehogs, despite their small size, actually can walk two kilometers a night quite easily looking for food, for water, for shelter, for mating potent potential. So they will travel great distances. And if we block them in, they simply can't do that. And their population then becomes an island. And that island then uh, suffers a, a, a localized extinction. So yeah, those, sorry, a very long answer, but it's us. Those are the problems. And yeah, there must be even more problems. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I, I I'm trying to. I, we could probably do the entire thing just on things that upset hedgehogs. But yeah. yeah. We could... <laughs> so the 30th of April, which is upcoming in four weeks or something, it's the National Hedgehog Week, if I'm correct, right? Hedgehog oh, yeah. Awareness Week. Yes. Hedgehog yes. Awareness Week. What are you planning on doing that? And yeah, well, what is, what is the plan? 
To be honest, um, I'm just going to carry on doing what I normally do because um, every week is Hedgehog Awareness Week as far as I'm concerned. Um, but no, we, we have a special week. It's just it's a, a way of flagging attention, getting people involved and excited. So um, I'm I have to I should point out I'm currently writing a book about something completely different. And my deadline is the end of April. Uh, for this book. I've written nearly 90,000 words so far, got about another 15,000 or so to write, and the book's got to be about 80,000 words. So I've got a lot of work to do. I haven't given it an awful lot of thought what I'm going to be doing in Hedgehog Awareness Week, probably lying down in a darkened room, sobbing. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I guess because it, it's Awareness Week, um, it would be natural that you guys are sharing, you know, what to look out for if you find a injured hedgehog or what are some signs that a hedgehog is not doing okay, that they should reach out and, and call for, for help. An individual hedgehog. So yes, this is, so at the Hedgehog Society, we have to look at things from two different perspectives. Uh, and so we look at the in welfare of individuals and we look at the conservation of a population. Uh, and those two things are, it feels like they should be the same thing, but they can often be quite separate. Uh, um, we also work with a wonderful bunch called the People's Trust for Endangered Species, running a campaign called Hedgehog Street, more of which I hope in a moment. Um, but the welfare of an individual hedgehog, hedgehogs are nocturnal. Um, they are, that, that, is, that is their default. Uh, they wake up as the sun goes down and they go snuffling around for food. If a hedgehog is in your garden sunbathing, something's wrong they don't sunbathe if it looks drunk um again something is definitely wrong yeah. so a hedgehog out in the daytime walking purposefully from one place to another that's just had its nest disturbed its day nest disturbed it's probably okay but if they're at any point lingering um then there is a problem if they've got any flies around them if any birds are paying attention to them uh these are really bad things so then you would simply scoop the hedgehog up. Um, I, I mean, you get used to handling them uh, and you can do it barehandedly as long as you do it carefully. I would recommend gloves or a towel or something. And you stick it in a box and you phone the British Hedgehog Preservation Society and uh, they will put you through to your local hedgehog rescue. Some of them even come out and collect, but um, and it's great. Oh, put a lid on the box just because they, even if they're poorly, they might try and crawl out. And if they do crawl out and you've popped it in your kitchen, it's a guarantee that the hedgehog will try and find a place to hide under the one thing you can't move in your room, like and it's sort of behind the freezer or under the cooker, um, just because uh, they like to antagonize uh, their potential rescuers. And how can people provide food and, and water, I think? Like, Water is an absolute crucial thing. So they are carnivorous animals. Um, you know, their natural diet are macroinvertebrates. So it's if you look at their diet stripped out through the year, worms, mollusks, um, beetles, the larvae of various insects. Uh, and um, so they, they will nosh down on basically they will eat what they find in front of them. They will eat uh, um, bits of, of, of carrion. So, you know, dead, dead birds or things, they'll, they'll eat on those, chomp on those. Um, so we need to replicate hedgehog food as much as possible. And, um, and the easiest thing is, is um, in fact, much easier than collecting worms in your garden and putting them in a dish and hoping they stay there. It was kitten food is actually one of the easiest things. Very high meat diet kitten food. Um, and there are various um, um, hedgehog uh, foods you can buy as well. But it tends to be cheaper just to go and get kitten kibble. The, the coarse, small little bits. Um, if hedgehogs eat just soft, meaty pet food all the time, then they end up building a lot of tartar on their teeth. So the kitten kibble tends to, to allow them to crunch and to clean their teeth better, which is a good thing for the hedgehogs as well, because lacking an opposable thumb, they really struggle with toothbrushes when you offer them. <laughs> you do. <laughs> And um, with with uh, hedgehogs, when people rescue them, um, what what do you think of these people that they're like, oh, I want to keep this hedgehog, or people that are maybe buying hedgehogs online? I don't know if that's normal in the UK, but I've I've certainly heard of this in some countries in Asia where people want to adopt hedgehogs. What, what's your thought on that? Well, okay, you must also first of all remember that there are many different sorts of hedgehogs. There are between 14 and 17 different species of hedgehog um, and they range from the west coast of Ireland uh, where we have 
our European hedgehog, the Western European hedgehog, that reaches across as far as the Czech Republic. Then you get the Eastern European hedgehog. Um, and we go all the way across Asia and down through Africa. So you've got many, many different species of hedgehog. Um, there, in America, in the early 1990s, there was a craze for pet hedgehogs. And they, uh, um, a, a exotic pet dealer found some hedgehogs in a cage. I think it was in Nigeria. Um, they were probably a Telerix frontalis or a Telerix alveventris. Uh, they, they were known at the time as pygmy hedgehogs. They're, bit, they're smaller than our Western European hedgehog, um, some slightly daintier faces and uh, much drier feces on the whole, which is good because then they smell less. Um, and so for a while, everybody wants to pet hedgehog. Then there was a ban on importing them. So the family trees became really quite linear. All sorts of horrible in, in, in inherited diseases crept in. But there's still a cohort of really keen hedgehog pet keeps in America. I've been there. I have been to the uh, Rocky Mountain Hedgehog Show and witnessed the International Hedgehog Olympic Games. Um, and, and, and the thing is, I, I've, I've now developed a stand up routine about this because people think I'm making it up. And I say I am not clever enough to make up what I saw. You know, these guys are batshit crazy um and i watched it and i tell you what i saw i didn't make this up anyway, so then the olympic games is much more like a triathlon anyway and they had to stop calling it an olympic games because the uh um the international olympic committee said yeah there might be some sort of sense of endorsement so it's, it's a triathlon um and the hedgehogs have to sprint in a big sort of hamster ball down a track you can't what you can't clap because it upsets them but you can do jazz hands Mm. Um, then they do the uh, hurdles, which is quite a challenge for an animal not normally predisposed to jumping. And finally, they do the floor exercises where they um, have to go over a teeter totter sort of seesaw uh, through a little tunnel and for reasons which nobody could adequately explain, uh, knock over a My Little Pony. Um, it, it's, it's quite nice. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of going to a place where you maybe for the first time have realized you're the most normal person in the room. <laughs> it's um, quite an so, experience. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, so pet hedgehogs, ah, no, don't do that. Um, and in the UK, the problem, obviously, where you've got wild hedgehogs in, in the natural environment, you are going to get, how, are you aiming this at adults or children? Or, I mean, do you have beeping for swearing? You know, what do you do you, with somebody? You can, you can, you can swear if you yeah, want. We'll beep <laughs> yeah, we can beep You'll beep me. So, so, the <laughs> and complete <laughs> who will pick up wild hedgehogs and try and sell them as pets. And um, these are animals totally unsuited for life in captivity. Really, really cruel thing to do. Um, so no, really do not, I do not encourage that in any way. Now you rescue a hedgehog, that's entirely legitimate. Uh, but clinging on to that hedgehog and not letting it go, that is, is disgraceful. Um, these are wild animals and they deserve to be in the wild. We know serve, work has been done looking at um, the fluctuations in stress hormones in hedgehogs in captivity, showing it does increase their levels of stress. Uh, and so every time you do that, you get raised levels of cortisol, you decrease uh, their fitness. And so therefore, we're not doing the hedgehogs any favors. Uh, let them go after they've been fixed up. Yeah. And, and is there a way to, how do you track these, these hedgehogs that have been rehabilitated? Is there a tracking system? How do you, yeah, how do you follow up? Do you look for them? Yeah, do you look oh, for them well, again? <laughs> so I'm, um, I mean, I started, some of my first work was doing work uh, up in, I say up in Orkney, and I was using blobs of paint on spines. We don't recommend that now due to the idiot factor um, in that some idiots will just put lots of paint on hedgehogs. Uh, I was being very careful doing it. Um, that meant I could identify individual hedgehogs. Now we've got much more subtle techniques. You can, um, if you have the correct licensing, you can use a pit tag, a small um, grain of rice size tag you can put under the skin, and then you can use a monitor, which will tell you which hedgehog that is. This is important because it then shows you if the hedgehogs you bring into care are always coming back into care because they're being found ill again. That might mean, A, the care isn't good enough or that there's something fundamentally wrong with the hedgehog. Um, on a bigger scale, you can radio track them. If you get again the licensing, pour small tags on the back, follow the hedgehogs. And now um, technology has improved so that the GPS tags work as well. All of this is done though under a scientific sort of uh, uh, banner with research, uh, uh, say, licensing required. Um, but yeah, you, and you can put little stickers on the um, the bits of plastic that go around electric wires. Mm -hmm. They're about the right size to put around a, a spine. So if you put three or four of those of one color around a spine with a bit of super glue, that marks them quite effectively too. There are ways of doing it. Um, and so it's 
but normally we tend to refer that just to the uh, just to the people doing the research. Yeah. So what is some, obviously your main role is to spread the message, if I'm correct. What are some of the ways you're doing that? What do you focus on most? Is it schools? Is it children? Is it social media or writing articles? Can you tell us a little bit more about it? So personally, I mean, as I, I'm freelance, I don't, um, I don't have a job. Uh, I'm I, I'm quite reactive. So when the Hedgehog Society gets in touch and says there is this nice bloke called Victor uh, who wants to do an interview, then yeah, that's that's where I get landed to do that. Um, independently, people do sort of have discovered me through social media. Um, I, I operate under the sort of handle of at Hedgehog Hugh because. Well, obviously that works, alliterative as it is. Um, and so through through Twitter and Instagram and, and Facebook and things, so people can find me that way. So I, I, I've, I get a lot of requests. In fact, I get more requests than I can sometimes handle. Um, and it, it gets a bit overwhelming at times. Uh, so I don't have a sort of strategy of going out other than, well, I say that, but with a slightly different hat on, so not the British Hedgehog Preservation Society, but um, I run a campaigning petition on a website called change.org. And the petition is change.org slash save our hedgehogs. Uh, simple as that. And I was contacted by change.org asking if I would set up a campaign to help hedgehogs. Uh, they recognized how um, excited people get about hedgehogs. So I I suggested all sorts of grand schemes like um, putting wildlife bridges, the eco ducts across motorways. And they said, no, that's no, too big. Um, so we ended up doing something so small and so trivial. If you remember earlier, I talked about one of the big problems hedgehogs face is the fragmentation of the habitat, chopping it into smaller and smaller pieces. One of the things we've been doing working with the People's Trust is the campaign Hedgehog Street. And that idea is quite simple. It's just that you know, you've got your garden is too small, but your garden may be amazing. It may have a lovely shallow entry pond and it may have a compost heap and a log pile, all sorts of things hedgehogs need. Uh, but your neighbor's garden may have a bramble patch and your garden beyond that may have got a femur hedgehog in it. So we're encouraging people to make small holes, just the 13 centimeter square holes in the bottom of their fences to allow hedgehogs to move between gardens. So that's mm -hmm. the hedgehog street idea. And then the idea came to me, it says, well, actually, people are building new houses all the time. Wouldn't it be great if they were obliged to put those holes in the fences to begin with? So I launched a petition to do that with change.org slash save our hedgehogs. And that is that's gone a bit sort of busy. Um, and now there is over one million one hundred thousand signatures on that petition. Wow. And so I then do, I write an update every couple of weeks or so, and that pings into the inboxes of you know, over a million people. And it's an update about hedgehogs, uh, normally directly about hedgehogs. Occasionally, um, I veer off into something slightly eccentric. As, as you've seen already, my conversations don't, <laughs> it's a bit, if you watch a hedgehog move across a field, very rarely will they go in a straight line. So, yeah. yeah, so it is. It's a, it, my, my conversational style is very much like a hedgehog. <laughs> style, but, um, and so, uh, yeah, so the, these updates are, uh, you know, they're, they're lighthearted, frequently, sometimes serious, but they tend to carry a campaigning message about hedgehogs. And so that's a way I found of reaching out to people who I wouldn't normally meet through the research circles or through the hedgehog rescue circles, but just the people who suddenly go, oh, hedgehogs, they look interesting, sign the petition, and then they've signed up for life to yeah. hedgehog updates so uh, i'm i'm hoping that after this you will sign up too it's not restricted to the uk anybody can do it i think hedgehogs are cute so why not <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you've done so much right and over the years what is maybe one or two things that are the most projects maybe or, or things you've done related to hedgehogs that you're most proud of gosh um I was never going to be an author. I never planned to be an author, uh, but um, I then wrote a book about hedgehogs. What have I got? So I was going to find one. There we go. Um, I got them. Um, there we go. There we go. Pretty affair. Um, so I ended up having an idea for a book because I know lots of people who write books. And so suddenly I became an author and now I'm just finishing my eighth book at the moment. Um, I've got two more commissions to write. So. That I have to say, because the, the only three of those have been about hedgehogs, I should say. I, I'm not obsessive. I do write about other things. 
Um, <laughs> though I have got a fourth book about hedgehogs I do want to write because um, beca because nobody, as far as I know, has ever met all 14 species of hedgehog around the world. And I think I should do that. I would need oh, money yeah. for that. So if, you, if any of your viewers happen to have a spare few hundred thousand pounds lying around and want to commission me <laughs> to go and do that, I'd be very, very happy to do that. Um, so no, I really... I'm really proud of, of sort of discovering that I have this thing that I like doing. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's a way of reaching out to people. So that's, that's, I'm really pleased with that. Um, I did the research which stopped conservationists killing hedgehogs in the Outer Hebrides. Um, that was quite good. Um, hedgehogs will eat birds' eggs. When they're imported into an island which has never had hedgehogs before and the birds will nest on the ground, hedgehogs will have an impact on the breeding birds' populations. Um, and so there was a campaign to remove the hedgehogs from an island in the Outer Hebrides called the Uists. Um, it began in 2003 and uh, the conservationists were killing the hedgehogs. And there's a bunch of us going, well, wait a minute, I, why are you killing them? And they said, oh, we have to. It's better for the hedgehogs. I go, no. Um, so I proved that actually, you know, these hedgehogs weren't going to suffer slow and lingering deaths if you move them to the mainland. It would be OK. So since 2007, they've been moving them alive to the mainland. Um, so I think, yeah, that was something which, which was, it was a very good thing to do. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm quite proud of it. I'm sure there's other things which I, oh, the petition. I'm really excited about the, no. Okay. No, I, um, ignore all that. I did my first stand up comedy, um, <laughs> on a stage in front of a paying audience of 500 people in a theater in London, um, doing a hedgehog stand up being, I think the world's only hedgehog stand up comedian. <laughs> yeah, that's, proud why of that you, that's why you need yeah, <laughs> no, haven't heard that what was your what was your best joke they're all filthy <laughs> <laughs> you should hear my beaver one now that's even worse but that's by the way <laughs> <laughs> amazing oh that's that's fantastic <laughs> yeah so what are you working on um you know in the future what, what is the future going to bring um, where does the the hedgehog conservation is gonna, you know, what, what's gonna happen in the future? What are some plans or things you're working on as an organization or as an individual? Um, well, as from an organizational point of view, one of the things we're really looking to do is to try and find out how many hedgehogs there are. I mean, obviously that's <laughs> nearly impossible. No, I mean, it sounds we don't know. We don't know how many hedgehogs yeah. there are. Um, it's very difficult to do that sort of uh, thing. And in fact, it's pretty much impossible. But what we're looking at putting in place is a, a, uh, a national monitoring survey, getting people involved all over the country. At the moment, a lot of the work is either very localized because it's a researcher doing a project or it's entirely based around people who love hedgehogs. And um, so we need to find we need to re re recruit people to be doing the research work in places where there aren't many people, for example. Um, having a handle on the number of hedgehogs will give us much more leverage when it comes to trying to get um, efforts put in place to help hedgehogs. We know over time what the population has changed, um, but we don't know what the numbers are. So, so we know that it, it was 100 in the year 2000, and it's down by 35%, so down to 65 um, in urban areas, but down to between, you know, maybe down to 25 in rural areas. So we, yeah, we, we know a relative population decline. And yeah. just since the year 2000, you know, they are dramatic population changes. It's my estimation, and I do a lot of my talks to groups of uh, um, older people. We have a group called the Women's Institute in the UK, um, and Towns Women's Guild and gardening clubs and University of the Third Ages. And I, in fact, I'm doing two lectures for them next week. These are audiences of people from you know, 65, 70 up to 85 or 90. And it gives a really interesting perspective back in time as to what they remember when they were children. And so it's trying to formalize something like that as well, trying to get an idea of what this really means. I, I think it's not unreasonable to suggest that, that the hedgehogs in the UK have declined by between 90 and 95 percent since the end of the Second World War. That's a, now, this is the favorite, the, our favorite species. Yeah. And it's the one we pay attention to. What that's telling us, because it's a generalist species, um, is that it's it, the cliche is a canary in a coal mine, coal mine. It's like a, a um it's warning us 
because what it's doing is saying there's a whole bunch of other stuff out here which you don't really care about which has been hammered and it's reflecting on us mm -hmm. because our populations are declining um so so looking at that bigger picture of of how we can monitor the population i think is really important yeah, yeah. that's a huge step if you would really mm -hmm. Put the facts to to your research and and you can say exactly like hey this is how the population is changing so we all we have at the moment are are relative things and we have yeah. we use roadkill for example hedgehogs are famously run over on the roads they're nocturnal they snuffle around the place they get squashed by cars fewer and fewer hedgehogs are being seen on the roads and for some people this is very exciting because fewer hedgehogs are being killed but actually we know that on a, a range of classes of road what that's telling you is that there are fewer and fewer hedgehogs in the wider environment they haven't got any cleverer when it comes to crossing roads no so yeah it's it, so so we have that sort of measure but it would be nicer to get something a little more uh, robust yeah yeah that's a good point anything else you would like to share with our listeners about hedgehog maybe a cool tip that no one knows about hedgehogs or, or anything else you would like to share okay i'll share something um <laughs> Here we go. So, A Prickly Affair was turned into a book called... Ah. Up Eagles, yeah. <laughs> so I'll say, I'll share that. So if any of your, any of your uh, 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 viewers happen to be of, of a, a um, Netherlandish disposition, uh, <laughs> then um, even though you're probably able to read the English better than I can, uh, it's in Dutch as well. Um, and in Polish, in fact. Um, mm. I've been... Those are the only two places so far. <laughs> um so mainly i would if you want to know more about what i get up to and it is a wide range of stuff you know that i've written a book about the iconography of head iconography of hedgehogs um yeah i do stand-up comedy about hedgehogs it's it's not just counting spines and sampling poo it's a whole range of stuff that goes on um and so the petition change.org slash save our hedgehogs or social media at hedgehog q um just just join up link in and see what goes on um and if you don't like it you can always go away this is quite simple yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's been so fun talking to you and getting to know more about you and what you do and the um hedgehog society uh, yeah it's been fantastic Gosh, I feel like I haven't talked enough about the Hedgehog Society. But anyway, it, I mean, you get the idea. They've got a great website, loads of good information on there, and Hedgehog Street website as well. So if you, yeah, if you pop these links up, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, we'll do that. Thank you so much for our lovely chat. And uh, <laughs> it's a pleasure. And we'll talk again soon, hopefully. Yeah, we'll hear more about you and more <laughs> what you do. <laughs> <laughs>